Good morning, church. Welcome to Sunday. During my lifetime, I can remember several world events that were broadcasted by the news day and night, much like this COVID news we hear constantly today. The news companies seem to love these events. As people watch news more and more, the news ratings go up. Of course, when their ratings go up, they can charge more to their advertisers, and thus bad news is good for the news companies because they make more money. I don't know about you, but I could use some good news today. I really could use some good news. Let's take a look real quick at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 for some good news. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, uh, we, read, no matter, we read this, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is yet to come. So we see here in this passage that the promises of God are yes in Christ. All that God has promised, he is doing and will do. The Holy Spirit in us is God's deposit for the purchases that he has already made. God is guaranteeing our future in him, and that is good news. Now, I'm to the point where I'm tired of watching sport reruns. How about you? Last week, we watched the 2017 World Series. We knew, we knew who was going to win before the program started. I just like to watch a, a live football match. I would like to watch a live baseball game, maybe even a golf tournament, where I don't know who won before the event began. Everything we're watching today is old news or bad news. Actually, a little good news would be helpful. I trust you'll stay with us throughout the service today for some good news as we look look at the scriptures as to God's benefits to us after the trial. We've been looking at Abraham and Isaac, and one more time this week, we're going to look at the benefits that God brought to Abraham after his trial. Hope you'll stay with us for our our singing, for our scripture reading, our prayer time, and just to enjoy some good news for a change today. As you know, all of our offerings have been online. And you can learn about our offerings from our church website or by clicking on the QR code uh, to get get our bank information. Uh, I just want you to know that all the money that comes into our church is dedicated to the Lord's work. And during this COVID time, we have had individuals... We have helped, we have had organizations that have contacted us uh, during, because of this, the difficulties they're facing, and, and we have given generously uh, throughout this time to people who are in need. The needs continue to come into us, and uh, we want to do all that we can to support them, and so your offerings uh, enable us as a church to continue to uh, help people during this, this, this COVID time with their needs as well. 
I want you to know that our Zoom groups are thriving. They really are. Uh, we have Zoom groups uh, on Monday night for men and women, Friday and Saturday for men and women. We have Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday groups for ladies. We have a young adults group on Sunday that meets and a youth group that meets Sunday afternoon. And all of these are open to anybody who'd like to jump in. So if you'd like to jump into some of our, our Zoom groups, just, just contact us. We can tell you, uh, get you the, uh, the, the Zoom uh, sign-in information, and we'd be happy to have you become a part of our Bible studies that we're doing every week uh, for those who, who join us for those groups. Finally, I just want, to, want you to know that we are meeting every Sunday here. We meet at 1045. Uh, if we get more than 60, we'll have a 9 o'clock and a 1045 service. We're just glad to be able to gather, to worship together, to sing together, to fellowship together. Yes, we're practicing the safety protocols uh, to, for, for, our, for our safety, uh, and we are enjoying uh, gathering together as God's church. So let's just pray this morning for the, our service as we begin. Thank you, Lord, for your service. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to sing your praises. And uh, we, we just dedicate this, this time to you today. In Christ's name, amen.
Hi, the scripture reading is from Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the bags of gold. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled account, accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the, the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's ha happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold come. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you know that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So that, take that bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and messing of teeth. Today is Sunday, the day we worship the Lord corporately in spirit and in truth. Before that, uh, Paul wrote to the Philippian believers in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He said, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God with pass, which passeth all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What a promise and what a command given for every believer in order to bring us closer to God. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we are, we are grateful for how you have protected us and provided for us for the last months that we are in the midst of pandemic, the coronavirus. We have experienced discomfort. We have experienced separation from friends, even family members, and even our families in the church. But Lord, you have shown yourself that you are faithful. And through your grace and your mercy, we have been protected from this virus. And we are grateful, Father, that you are more than able to do that in our midst. And that's why this morning we are ready to worship you in spirit and in truth. We want to thank you, Lord, for your love and for your mercy toward us, for forgiving our sins through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through this sacrifice he had offered on the cross of Calvary, 
our sins could be forgiven and was forgiven because we repented of our sins and put our trust in Him as our only Savior, not by good works, but only by faith through Him. And through that, Lord, we have a relationship with You. And enough reason to worship You this morning with our brothers and sisters. But Lord, we want to pray for the government of Indonesia, the leadership from the president down to the mayors and down to the Kelurahan. We pray, Father, that you will continue to provide wisdom in running this country so that we will be safe as always. And in this country, we enjoy peace and order, and we owe that to you. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to, sa to safeguard us and to protect us. We pray also for our brothers and sisters, and only in this church, GIBC, but in all uh, the world who are worshiping you in spirit and in truth in the same way that we're worshiping you right now. We pray, Father, for those who were restricted because they are in a hostile community, hostile environment. We pray, Father, that your peace will guard them, will keep them safe, and will give them joy at the same time, knowing that the God we serve is sovereign and able to protect us. We pray for those brothers and sisters who are grieving because of the loss of a, lab, of a loved one. We pray, Father, that you will continue to comfort their hearts through your word. We pray also, Lord, as we worship you today, this morning, prepare our hearts and give us the courage, Lord, to apply whatever principle we have heard in today's message through your servant. And give us the courage, Lord, to reach for more souls as you have given us the opportunity in this pandemic. We are grateful also for the souls that were saved because of the circumstances. And we are thankful also, Lord, that through the circumstances that is uh, in our midst, people were given a chance to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And many were given a chance to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior. We rejoice with them. And we continue to pray that as an individual Christian or a follower of you in this country, we will, we will be more intense in sharing the gospel to those who are lost. We pray, Father, as we worship you and through hymns, songs, and through your word, may our hearts be ready to receive your correction, to receive your rebuke, and to receive your instruction. Today is a day of blessing for us because we have given we were given an opportunity to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Yes, 
Most bad news is just bad. It can't be made good. It is just bad news. The good news is that God is working in us during bad times to make us better in him. Do you get that? In bad times, God is working to make us better in him. Today, I'm going to ask the question, what do we learn about God's response to obedient faith? Now, our person of study here today is still Abraham, and we're looking at Abraham's life after he willingly sacrificed Isaac on the altar in obedience to God. But from that event, we're going we're gonna to look at, 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 at what, how God responded to Abraham. What, did, what was Abraham's benefit after the trial? And I hope we'll see in that some parallels to us today. For there, there, there's always an afterwards to the tests of life, always. We don't just have a test and nothing's afterward. I mean, when I was in school, um, I always wanted to know after the test what my grade was. What came after the test? And so it is in life. We are in the middle of a test. We want to know what's going to happen afterward because there's always an afterward to the tests of life. Hebrews 12, 11, we read this, No discipline seems to be pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The disciplines of life later... Are, are, bring benefits into our life once we've been trained. 1 Peter 5 is a very difficult verse to look at for me. 1 Peter 5.10, we read this, The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. Look at that with me again. After you have suffered a while. Now, we don't like the idea of suffering. In fact, we really don't like the idea of suffering. We sit on padded cushions. We eat pretty much when we want to. We have a little headache. We take an aspirin or an excedrin. We, we don't like to suffer. We want to find out what our pain is from and how do we get rid of it. But he says very clearly that we can expect to suffer a little while. But he says afterwards, God restores you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. We can say today that God never wastes suffering. In Job 23.10, we studied this several weeks ago. Job says that God knows the way that he takes in my life. God knows the way he is leading. And when God has tested me, Job said, I will come forth as gold. The furnaces of affliction purify the gold in the end. And so as we come to the trials of life, we can look forward to a purification, a time when God makes us better. I read a blogger this week who put it this way. As we mature into adults, all too often we forget to learn from the trials. We forget that every situation, both good and bad, is a perfect opportunity to learn something new. Some of the worst, most painful times of your life, if you let them, will be powerful experiences of preparation. In fact, he says, in my life, most of the times of great struggle, defeat, and failure were absolutely critical to my abilities to succeed at something later in life. Do you get that? The trials and difficulties and pains were critical to things he needed for later in life. Then he says, the skills necessary were built during the difficult time. We all know that the trials of life make us stronger later, but in the midst of the trial, we kind of just want to get out of it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm all too familiar with the disciples in the boat with Jesus during the storm. They didn't think about the creator of the sea being with them. They kind of forgot all the miracles he had done, and instead they panicked. All they wanted was to get out of the storm. 
They had no, no desire to endure the intensity of this particular storm on them or on their boat. In fact, their conclusion humanly was, we're going to die tonight. They said, Lord, wake up, save us, we are perishing. We are going to die. We feel this in the trials of life. We really do. We feel what the apostles felt that night. There's a great hymn that most of us know and love. The hymn is called, It Is Well. The hymn has a terrible backstory to it. Let me tell you just a little bit about the backstory. On September 5th of 1861, the author, Horatio Spafford, married Anne Larson of Stavanger, Norway. <laughs> they married in Chicago. Spafford was a lawyer and a senior partner in a large law firm. They were supporters and friends of evangelist Dwight Moody, D.L. Moody. They knew Moody and supported him and were considered the friends of Moody. Because of his financial ability, Spafford invested in real estate in the north part of Chicago, which was a, a growing section of the city. But the spring of 1871... He made his investments. In October of 1871, the great Chicago fire reduced the city to ashes, destroying most of Spafford's investments, near total financial loss for Horatio Spafford. Two years after the devastation of the great fire and the loss of so much of his wealth, he planned a trip for his family to uh, go to Europe. They were going to, to see and to hear their friend Moody, speak in a great revival in Europe. Because of some difficulties with his, his real estate projects, Spafford sent his wife and four daughters ahead, and he was going to follow them a few weeks later. On November 22, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic, the steamship, the Ville, Ville du Havre was struck by another ship, the, sh the ship that struck them was an iron ship. And the ship that Spafford's wife and daughters was sailing on went down. 226 souls were lost in that ship, including all four of Spafford's daughters. His wife, upon arriving in England, sent her husband a text, two words. They, they didn't call them texts then. They, they uh, called them telegrams. Sent them a telegram with two words saying, saved alone. I'm saved, but our daughters are not. I am alone. Not too long thereafter, Spafford himself took, uh, took a ship to England to join his wife. And while passing near the spot where the ship his daughters were on went down, the captain called, up to, called Horatio Spafford and said to him, sir, I think you might want to know this is about the spot <clears throat> where your daughters are buried in the sea. Horatio Spafford took up a pen and began to write his thoughts. His thoughts came out like this. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou, God, has taught me to say it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, and no doubt he felt the buffetings of Satan. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, which he had endured, the loss of finances, the loss of family. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. He then wrote these words, which are some of the greatest words written. My sin... Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It is well with my soul. There's a verse we don't sing too often that he also wrote that day. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live, if Jordan above me shall roll. In other words, I'm in the, I'm in the water, the sea's above me. 
For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine. For in death as in life, thou shalt whisper sweet peace to my soul. He ended his thoughts with this last verse. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds will be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Let me ask you, do you think it was well with his heart? Do you think it was well with his mind? I don't think so. He had lost finances, and he had lost family. He was in the midst of the greatest trial of his life. But he could say, because I know that God is in control, it is well where it matters. It is well with my soul. Suppose with me, for an instant, that during this this journey, if Horatio Spafford had decided instead to drown his sorrows and to, to, to to drink himself numb during the trip across the Atlantic, who would have blamed him? The crew would have said, yeah, if that was me, that's what I'd be doing. If I'd have lost all my money and lost my daughters, I'd be, I'd be numb, numbing my mind and heart as well. He had lost so much, he deserved a little numbing from the pain. But had Horatio Spafford turned to, turned to an outside source for comfort, we would have lost a great hymn of hope. He turned actually to the only one that could bring him comfort. He turned to the Lord. There's always an afterward to the tests of life. We're going to hear testimonies of God's greatness after the end of this COVID crisis, at least the biggest part of it. We're going to hear how how God intervened in people's life and how God took care of their souls when they lost their finances and their family. We'll look back like Spafford did, and we'll realize that God gave peace where it matters. He gave peace in our soul. So today we're going to see how Abraham received several blessings from God because of his obedient faith. First of all, he received a new approval from God. He received a new approval from God. In Genesis 22 and verse 12, And God said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I call this a heavenly pat on the back, a heavenly attaboy, God reaching down and encouraging Abraham and saying, now I know you went through this trial faithfully. Now I know the real condition of your heart. He In in, in verse 5 of 22, Abraham described this entire event as worship. He told told his his men, Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey and the lad. I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Abraham, in the midst of this great trial of his faith, he said in his heart, I am going to worship God. This is not without precedent for, for Job when he lost everything. He's sitting in ashes in front of his home. He's scraping the boils off of his body. And he says he worshiped God. Worshiping God in affliction is the best thing that we can do. Psalm 96, verses 7 through 9. The psalmist writes and he says, Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Bring an offering. What did Abraham do? He brought an offering. What was the offering? It was his own son. In days of kings and courts, you didn't dare go to, go to, to, to visit a king of another country if you didn't take a peace offering with you. You would enter into his, into his courtroom with something saying, I want to make peace with you. Oftentimes, other kings came with their daughters and said, I give you my daughter as a token of my desire to be at peace with you. When we come before God, we need to come before God with something that is important to us, something we are giving to him. 
often in the trial, we feel like God is taking something from us that we aren't willing to give. But know this, that we God wants us to come before him with an offering to him. Verse 9 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. You see, my friend, no one comes before God with a flippant or careless attitude. We don't see Abraham and Isaac on the altar that day being, being funny or making jokes or, or having humor. We said that, see them in a very serious environment. The trials that bring us before God often bring us with a seriousness before God. God is only approached by those who come before him with the glory that's due to his name. And this is worship. This is worship. This was the action of Abraham on Mount Moriah. He came before God to worship God. He obeyed God's will. He sought to please God's heart. And the scripture says that God commended him. God approved of Abraham after the trial. Is it worth to go through the trials if at the end we can hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant? I believe it will be. We're not quite there yet, but I believe it will be. In Matthew 25, 14 to 30 is the parable of the landowner who gave his servants an investment. He gave them this investment And he said to them, be busy with my investment until I return. When he returned, there were two that had done well with the investment. And he said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm sure those those servants that day were happy about two on two accounts. One, the master came back. They could take a break from their labor for him. Secondly, they were happy to hear him say to them, well done. You're a good, you're a faithful servant. Isn't that what we want to hear from our Lord one day? We've invested our life for him. We've come through the trials of life for him. And when he returns and we find ourselves in his presence, he says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. We hear that that heavenly pat on the back, that attaboy, you did well, thank you. It'll be a time of rejoicing. There was one servant in the parable, however, who did not do well with his master's investment. He buried it in the ground and gave it to him when he came back. And the master wasn't pleased with him at all. In fact, the master said, you are a wicked and a lazy servant. You did not work for me. You did not endure the trials and difficulties of life well for me. And he called him a wicked and lazy servant. I'm thankful for Abraham's example of one who, when he came through the trial, enjoyed the blessing of God as God confirmed Abraham at the end of the trial. The second blessing of of obedient faith was that Abraham received back a new son. He received back a new son. We don't know a whole lot about the conversation of Abraham and Isaac that day, but we we, we, we can pretty much imagine that Isaac was a changed man after that day. After his father tied him to the altar, fully expecting to feel the knife on his throat, God speaks from heaven and puts a ram in the thicket. Isaac gets off of the altar and is restored to his father. Can you imagine the hugs and the tears between father and son when God restored the son to his father? Romans 12, 1 and 2, we are called to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. A living sacrifice. God doesn't want to kill us. He wants us to live for him. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You want to know what God's will is? You want to be a son or a daughter of whom God is pleased? 
Make your body a living sacrifice to him. When we give our bodies to God as a living sacrifice to him, God in return renews our mind, directs our life, enables us to know his good and perfect will for our lives. We are God's sons and God's daughters. You want to know God's will for your life? Are you willing to sacrifice your life for him? If you're not willing to sacrifice your life for God, don't expect to know God's will for you. You cannot become that new creature, that follower of Christ, until you are willing to surrender all to him, humble your entire life to him, give to him that which is most important to you, that he may give back to you your life to follow his plan. You see, God gave Isaac to Abraham, and then Abraham gave Isaac back to God. That's possible because James tells us that every good and perfect gift is from God. God will ask from you that which he has given you. And you might say, but God, you gave this to me. Why would you want it back? And God said, I want you to trust me. I want you to give me everything in your worship to me. We give that which we love to the Lord And the results that are beyond our understanding, our results will bring glory to God forever. There's very little in this life that lasts forever. However, when we come through God's trials, praising him, the result of that lasts forever. You say, that's a hard thing to do. It is. But God wants us to give to him that which we love in this life. Sometimes we struggle. God, you gave this to me, and now you want want it back, but now, but you gave it to me. It's mine. And we will worship the gift instead of the giver of the gift. The gift becomes more important than the God who gave us the gift. Give me an example. God gave you the ability to work. So every day that you go to work and you earn money because you spend your time working for an employer, you receive a paycheck, you say, I worked for this money. And you're right, you did work for the money. But who gave you the ability to work? Who gave you the mind to be able to do the work that you're doing? And if God says to you, I want you to give me money Can we say, okay, God, you gave me the ability to work, so I have no trouble giving you money? Money is easy to give, quite frankly. Time is harder. Children are harder. God says, I want your children to live for me. I want your children to serve me. That might be a hard, that's a lot harder to give away than just to give money. We must not put our gift above the giver. I, Ab- Abraham did not put Isaac above God. He didn't gripe and say, but God, you gave me this son. He's mine now. Abraham recognized that the gift from God was what God wanted. And Abraham gave God the gift because God was worthy of his own son. Consequently, Abraham proved that his love for God was greater than his love for his son. There are times in your life, my friend, God will ask you or he will just take from you something that you love to see if you love him more. If you you don't love God more than what he took, you'll find yourself bitter at God. You'll find yourself angry at God for taking this out of your life. Again, during these COVID times, people have lost all, all kinds of things that they loved. Either we are thanking God for the trial, or we are angry at God for the trial. We must fight bitterness to rejoice, as Abraham did, in being able to come through a trial for God's glory. Third blessing of obedient faith, we find that God gave Abraham new assurances. He gave him new assurances. In Genesis 22 and verse 16, 
the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. And he said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, which is the sacrificing of his son, and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. God had given these promises to Abraham before, but they took on a greater assurance now. God said, because you've come through this, because you have agreed to, to, to go through this test With me. Now I assure you of these promises in a greater level, which is what God did. Charles Spurgeon used to say that the promises of God never shine brighter than the furnace of affliction. The promises of God never shine brighter than the furnace of affliction. We might not like the trials, but at the end of the trial, we find God's assurance carrying us in a greater and greater way. There were two men and an, and an altar on the top of an empty mountain. There was no lights, no cameras, no nobody taking notes, no historian, just the two of them and an altar. But because of Abraham's obedient faith in that test, the world was changed. God's assurance came because Abraham endured the test and went all the way to the end, believing that God was in control of his life. Christ went to the cross. He suffered on the cross. He went into the grave. He rose from the grave. The end of the the, the, of the trial of Christ's life is the resurrection. Through his resurrection, we have assurance that all he went through had purpose and value. The end of the trial brings greater assurance. Christianity itself is a belief in God's promises. We believe that God's promises are eternal. Hebrews 11 says, Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God, and Abraham, we read, became the father of all who live by faith. We look to Abraham as an example. He came out with greater assurance that what he was doing was exactly what God had for him to do that day. The fourth blessing of obedient faith is this, that Abraham learned a new name for God. He learned a new name for God. In verse 14, Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh, as it is said today, in the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. This name, Yahweh, Jehovah Yahweh provides, Yahweh Jireh. God provided, and and, and Abraham now knew God by this name, the God who would provide, the God who would take care of me, the God who will see me through the trial all the way to the end and will provide for me all the way there. When the apostles came out of the storm with Christ, they said, what manner of man is this? They thought they knew Jesus. But now they knew him by a greater name, the one who could calm the sea. Yes, we come through the trials, and we learn of God's, we learn, uh, of, of God's abilities to help us and to care for us. The founder of the China Inland Mission, J. Hudson Taylor, he had these two words hung on a plaque in his house, it is said. The word Ebenezer, which means Up until this time, hitherto, the Lord has helped us. And the word Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will see to it, the Lord will help. So whether Hudson looked backward at what the Lord had done or looked forward to what needed to be done, he knew that God was with him. And he was reminded by the names of God of all that God would do to take care of him. The more we know of God, the greater our ability to trust him in all ways of life. You might ask yourself today, what names do you know God by? There are some who only know God as the prime mover, the one who started it all in order, the great clockmaker who sits back in a disinterested chair and watches his clock tick down through time. There are those who think of God as a heavenly grandfather, 
who just kind of sits up there and watches over and does a good thing here and there for his grandchildren that he observes. But then there are those who see him as God, Jehovah, the God of creation, the God of all humanity, the God of all that we see. We see him as judge, for he is the judge of all the earth. David said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? No, that was Abraham who said that. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? He will. He will always do what's right because he is the perfect judge. But we also see him as our father. So Paul could write in Romans 8 and call him our Abba Father, the Father who is close to us, not the Father who's on a journey, not the Father who's going off to work, but the Father who is right there with us. And the name that you know God by will help carry you through the struggles and the trials of your life. Abraham came out with a new name for God. The fifth blessing we see here that Abraham received from God by his obedient faith was that Abraham came away from his trial with a deeper love for the Lord. He came out of this trial with a deeper love for the Lord. Remember uh, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who rebuked Jesus for not being there when Lazarus died. After Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, Mary came to a dinner where Christ was sitting and she anointed his feet with a precious ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. She came out of that trial with a new love for her Lord. And so when we come to the trials of life, we should come to love him in a greater way, in a deeper understanding. In John 14, 21, I want you to notice the words love in this passage and the word keep or obey. All right, notice the word love. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. We will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Here's God's eternal message. Jesus says, these are the words of the the Father who sent me. This is the eternal message from God. As we come to the trials, we find God faithful to his word and faithful to those who love him, and we love him more. We love him more. Only those who are faithful to Christ will know and see him in this way. After the resurrection of Christ, the scripture records that he was seen by over 400 people at one time. He was seen by by the 12 and by the 70. But we have no record of Christ seeing someone who rejected him during his lifetime. Now, I think if I'd have been Christ, I don't want to go go back to Herod's throne room, knock on his door and say, hey, Herod, I just want you to know I'm back. (laughs) I'd have gone to Pilate and say, hey, Pilate, uh, you know, you hung me on the cross, but it didn't work. I'm back. Wouldn't, isn't that what we would have done? But Christ didn't do that. He went to the ones that loved him, the ones who, who came through the trial of his death. Those are the ones he appeared to, the ones who loved him during the trial came to love him more after the trial. Before the crucifixion, the apostles forsook him and fled. After his resurrection, they hung around with him. They watched him ascend, and they gathered for 10 days and waited together in prayer to see what God was going to do in sending his Holy Spirit. They came through the trial with a greater love for Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3, we find in verse 17, Paul writes that you being rooted and established in love. Verse 18 of Ephesians 3, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Verse 19 of Ephesians 3, to know this love that passes knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Our friend, we come through the trials of this, this life and we know a deeper and greater love for the Lord who's carried us through the trial. 
Can you look back on your trials with joy? James said, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Can you look back on your trials with joy? Can you look back and see that through your trial, God taught you to yield to him and to trust him and that he will carry you through it? We thank God for the faith of Abraham. We thank God for the obedience of Christ, who, of whom Isaac was a type. The son of Abraham agreed to be tied on the altar for the sin of this family, but the son of God agreed to be nailed on the cross for the sin of the world. With this in mind, think about this today. How is God shaping us today? What altar does God want us either to get up on or to use to make a sacrifice to him? Let me ask you that again. How is God shaping us today? What altar does God want us to either get up on or to use to make a sacrifice to him? Either way, the trial of our faith is before us. Either God wants us to get on an altar or he wants us to sacrifice something to him on an altar. Is God worthy of our sacrifice? Was God worthy of the gift of Abraham's son? Was God worthy of Isaac's willingness to get up on the altar? We would say that whatever God is calling us to, he is worthy both of our obedience and of our deepest sacrifice. That which may be the most difficult for us to sacrifice, God is worthy of these offerings to him. We find that Abraham's offering up his son was the height of worship, for nothing in his life was of more importance than Isaac. He worshiped, he worshiped God with everything that he had. When God calls us to worship something to him that is of great value to us, can we give it to him? Can we say, yes, Lord, even this, it came from you anyway. I gladly give it back to you. This is my sacrifice, my gift to you, because you are worthy of everything that I have. Perhaps you're in a sacrifice, I'm sorry, perhaps you're in a test today. Perhaps you're facing a sacrifice God's calling from you today. It's difficult, but we can make it through. We can believe that God is who he says he is, and God will both receive our worship, and God will take care of us through the worship. As beautiful as gold is, gold must pass through a fire. You don't just take a raw chunk of gold out of the ground and make jewelry out of it. You have to refine that gold. You have to put it through a fire. Life is a battlefield. It's not easy. There's always difficulties coming or going all the way, all the way through life. We face trials all the time, trials that are, are designed to make us stronger and better. The trials aren't designed to make us weaker and bitter. I mentioned earlier, watch out for bitterness in trials. Trials aren't designed to make us bitter and weaker. They're designed to make us stronger and better, the person God wants us to be. It could be that behind the prettiest smile is the deepest secret. Behind the prettiest eyes are the most tears that have been cried. Behind the kindest hearts lies the greatest pain that can be endured. As we come to the trials of life, God shapes us to the men and women that he wants us to be for his glory. And in the end, we recognize the value and thank him for carrying us through the test. What trial are you in today? Are you remaining faithful to God in it? What trial are you in today? Be assured of this, that God loves you in the trial and that God will bring you through the trial, and God will bless you when he's finished with that trial and with that test. We're grateful for God's example to us today from Abraham. And we know that God never changes, and so when God brings us, his children, through the trials and tests of this life, he has a purpose. In the end, we'll look, at the, we'll look back, and we'll see that, yes, God did carry me. God was with me, and I am now a better person 
for the trial that God led me through. God's tests aren't, don't seem fair. It feels like you receive the test before you get the instruction. And we feel like we're bound to fail because we aren't even sure what to do. God just calls us to be faithful to him, to submit to him in the trial, to rejoice in him and to worship him, even when it's hard. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, today for your word. Thank you for the teaching from your word that is so clear to us. Yes, we are thankful today for Abraham's willingness to obey you throughout this test that you put him through. We're thankful that Isaac didn't rebel against his father and his God, but Isaac also submitted to the test. We're thankful that Jesus Christ came through the test as well, the test of Calvary for our salvation. Lord, we don't like the tests of this life. We don't like the test we're in right now. But we, we know that you've got a purpose in these tests. Help us to trust you more today. Help us to know that you have the end of this test already in place. Help us to trust you all the way through it. And above that, help us to worship you as we put parts of our lives and perhaps even all of our lives on the altar that you call us to. Help us to do so in worship of you for you are worthy of all of that worship. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you for saving us from our sin and for leading us into a place of eternal peace and security with you. Help us to trust you for our salvation in every part of our life between now and eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.